Can I welcome everyone to the 14th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda items three, four and five in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. That is agreed. Agenda item two is... Uh, the committee will hold its first evidence session for its inquiry into empty homes in Scotland. And I'd like to welcome Shahina Din, National Manager, Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, and Derek Logie, Chief Executive of Rural Housing Scotland. Given the time available, we'll move straight on to questions, and I'll start by asking, what are the main reasons why homes become and remain empty? Uh, just whoever. Um, we have evidence from um, annual surveys that we send out to empty property officers um, every year since 2010 that there's many reasons why properties become empty. Um, they can be quite complex. Often it's um, somebody's passed away, an owner's gone into residential care, perhaps a property's been repossessed or people no longer have the funds to refurbish the property. Um, so it is life situations rather than often people just desiring to leave their home empty is what we would say. Okay. Mr Logan? Yeah, I mean, these, these, these issues apply in rural and urban locations. I think specifically rural um, reasons are to do with kind of change of, of um, working practices on, on estates, so there's less staff perhaps, so there's kind of historical um, um, cottages that have been let previously or tied cottages. Um, you can get issues to do with agricultural tenancies where um, a lot of empty cottages will be part of the farm tenancy and so will be covered by that farm tenancy. Now, depending on how long the farm tenancy is, will really depend on whether the, the tenant wants to spend any money doing up the houses. Um, they, may, they may well not think there's any possibility of a return, so they'll just leave them empty. Um, so, yeah. Right, so part place. of the reason why there's proportionately more empty homes in rural areas then? Can be. I mean, there's issues, there's issues in some areas to do with historical depopulation, um, issues which a lot of communities are looking to rectify through their own activities and using empty properties as part of the solution to um, bringing back um, or creating opportunities for young people in particular in those kind of communities. Uh, do you have any comment to make on that? I suppose the other th reason is market failure. So there could be declining, tre you know, economic trends in specific areas as well, and that can often impact on properties lying empty, where owners don't see a solution to, you know, bringing the property back into use. Can I ask, is, is there a particular uh, tenure of housing that is high, most highly affected by this? Private sector, for example, private rental sector, owner occupied sector. We would say that it's a broad brush. It, it sweeps across, um, you know, all different types of buildings. And t in terms of what we deal with, we only deal with private sector empty homes, so we don't really touch on the social sector. Yeah, I think I think there's very few um, empty properties in, in the social rented or council housing in in rural Scotland. Yeah, and I suppose my last question, and I'll let you in a minute. Graham. Uh, my last question around. This is what impact do you see empty homes having on local communities? Um, have massive impact on communities depending on where that empty property is. I mean, there's properties that could be, you could be living next door to an empty property in the overgrown garden, you know, antisocial behaviour, sometimes fire, you know, that sort of thing can have a real impact on a community. In terms of that place, you know, people could be wandering about and seeing, you know, a run-down house and it's not pleasant for place for that sense of place um, but even just other impacts for example economic impacts if you've got somebody living in that property they're more likely to be paying council tax they're more likely to be spending in the shops and in the communities and whether there are big multinational stores but that store would then likely employ somebody else to you know in the shop so it does have an, an impact on a community um, and also just sustaining populations as well in terms of the rural stuff that Derek will talk about. Um, sometimes if you just bring back two empty properties that can you know, sustain a school or a post office. 
Can I, uh, sorry, before I let you answer with that, uh, on, on that point, um, what role would you see the, your partnership having in trying to ensure that even when empty homes are there, between the time homes become empty and become reused, and, and making sure that some of the things that, that you described don't happen? partnership is to um, share best practice um, and you know encourage at a local authority level to bring properties back into use and we see the best way of doing that is to have a dedicated empty homes officer because the empty homes officer can go in um, and engage with the owner ask them what they think the issues are what what sort of options are available to that owner to try and bring that property back into use and as a partnership if we can try and share the best practice so we can say well you know for example in a specific area um, a matchmaker scheme where um, developers are linked up with um, um, potential empty homeowners that can work or for example in another area where you are engaging that owner and giving them information on VAT discounts that often works so it's just about sharing the knowledge and the best practice and that's what the empty homes partnership is there for and also to look at the barriers that um, our officers come to us and say actually this is a barrier that we're all facing so for example they will say to us that um, probate cases can take a while and we're looking, we're looking to investigate, you know, what are the touch points for probate cases and how long are they expected to last? And is there something that, as a policy solution, that we can look at? OK, thank you, Mr. Lowe. Just, just the previous point about the impact on, on, on communities is, um, you know, in, in, in many rural, rural communities, empty homes are up to kind of, I think in, in the North Isles of Orkney, something like 17% of houses are empty. Plus, you've got the, the houses that are empty because they're, they're, they're not occupied full time. So you've got a permanent population, which is maybe, I don't know, half of the houses in the area. So that impacts on both in terms of the sustainability of services and of like schools and shops, but it also impacts in terms of how people feel about a community. You know, the kind of the idea of dark villages is quite kind of strong within certain communities in the, in the winter. You know, the whole place is just dark because there's nobody living there and empty homes contribute to that quite considerably in some places. Okay, th thanks very much. Graeme, you wanted to come in on that and then the, you can ask your questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Convener. It was just um, the, on, on the, the empty homes in rural areas. Is there an issue um, with sort of privately rented properties, um, some of the older ones and the, the, the difficulty of bringing them up to scratch um, the cost of that yeah. um, uh, it being too much and therefore properties are left empty. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a, an issue to do that, but there are, through the empty homes officers that Sheen has talked about, um, there's a number of schemes which have been developed so that, um, you know, in Argyle, for example, you can, they'll put in up to £20,000 um, to help an owner bring that property back into use um, for letting. Um, if they contract that let to the local housing association for 10 years so there's ways in which grant can be tied into to, to leasing so there's a kind of like a quid pro quo in terms of um you know the, the longer the more grant it takes the longer you have to put it into this kind of leasing scheme and Is leasing it? schemes have been around for a long time i mean way back in the, the late 80s rural leasing schemes were kind of the bread and butter of in fact shelter pioneered rural leasing schemes way back then and they were very successful in actually delivering small numbers of houses or, or affordable houses in, in rural areas. Are, are these grants coming from the council? Yeah. yeah. You can see that in Priest and Galloway are doing something similar as well with their town centre living fund um, and they offer grants as well to bring properties back into use where they see that there's a strategic housing need um, and it works um, but it is an investment from the council that's required. I mean, it was previously, the Scottish Government did put things, there was a, a, a scheme called lead tenancies where housing associations got involved in this kind of work as well. And, and that was funded through what was housing association grant at that time. So, but as far as I know, that's not possible anymore. And obviously there was also a rural anti-properties grant for a time. Now you see occasionally within the reports that there's still one or two, but it's not promoted and it's, it's not necessarily available. 
he you're being ordered uh, to get closer to yeah. your mics, I think. Um, so, no, this is interesting. So, you mentioned two councils that are using this. Are any others? Cross have got a grant scheme as well, a loan and grant scheme that they do. Um, I'm just trying to think about all the rural locations. But yeah, I would say Perth and Kinross or Gail and Butte and Dumfries and Galloway would definitely be, you know, best practice from the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership point of view. Can okay. we let Annabelle in first? She wanted to ask a supplement. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming in. Um, just picking up on a, a, a perhaps more technical point that uh, Shahina referred to a moment ago about uh, circumstances where the home is empty, the house is, the property is empty following uh, death and the estate being wound up. Um, it would be interesting um, uh, in due course when I, I think there's a conversation about the need to actually obtain much greater data about the reasons, you know, what homes are actually empty and the circumstances and so forth. And I think that's a question, line of questioning that will come. Uh, from colleagues. Um, but at the moment, um, uh, I think Sheena had said that you were currently looking at this issue, but of course, from a technical perspective, um, where there is a, a heritable property, where there is a home, uh, you need to, in Scotland to obtain confirmation in order to, to convey title to that home. But in order to get confirmation, you tend to, uh, as the solicitor winding up the state, seek to identify all assets so that all assets are included as required in the, the application for confirmation. So that actually can be the time-consuming bit, that the house could be the easy bit in that you can see that there is a title, you can include that, but you wouldn't normally seek to apply for confirmation just for the heritable assets, you would apply for confirmation for all assets and that can take some time. So I just wonder in terms of your discussions, Shahina, what, what potential solutions there may be to that that you're looking at. To be honest with you, we're really at early stages with this because one of the things that we're looking to do, like you say, is increase our knowledge on empty um, homes. We've got to a point where the partnership is quite mature um, and now we're looking at actually what are the policy solutions. We previously didn't have a policy officer in the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, which we recruited to last September. And these are some of the lines of work that he does have. I don't know what the solution is, to, if I'm really honest. <laughs> Well, I, I could see that there, yeah. there, there would be difficulties in seeking to, to, to um, you know, for the objective that you're seeking to progress that work that needs to take place, uh, and it can be quite time-consuming getting, identifying assets and then getting details of the assets such that you can actually then include them. But, I mean, obviously it's, it's an important area to look at, but that goes back to my original point, which is it would be interesting to see actually in due course when further data is, is gathered, to what extent the, the scenario that we're talking about represents uh, any significant element of the empty homes, and if rather actually uh, it is other sets of circumstances that are more significant as far as empty homes are concerned. I think a starting point for us was to actually map out the entire process so we can see actually where uh, what, where is it getting stuck and actually where do officers think it's getting stuck because sometimes um, there's a disparity between that and um, we can see that clearly with repossessions because that's another area where um, officers are telling us well mortgage lenders are not you know getting rid of properties quick enough and mortgage lenders have um, an obligation to achieve the best price and you know push that forward so when we spoke to the council of mortgage lenders they were saying well this is our position and officers are saying well no this is not what's happening on the ground so what we're starting to do is again it's a similar process for um, probate cases in terms of mapping it out so we can actually see where is it getting it stuck is it getting stuck because the officer thinks it's repossessed but actually hasn't gone through that entire process you know the calling up notice may have been served but actually the decree hasn't been granted or what what where is it getting stuck and I think that's what we'd like to do similarly with probate cases so that we can try and apply time scales so that officers can even just be um, empowered to know that this is the sort of time scale that this process takes and therefore we can move on to something else or actually is there a situation where we need to encourage these time scales to be quicker okay thank you thank you yeah, yeah thanks um, can I can I ask you both about the the use of compulsory purchase powers and um, the difficulties that councils in, encounter with that and, and whether it's being used widespread. So one of the things that we recently um, hosted was a compulsory purchase workshop 
Um, and that was on the back of empty homes officers telling us that they didn't know exactly what their role was in the compulsory purchase, um, because actually they have quite a significant role for compulsory purchase of empty empty properties in the way that I see it, but um, officers were not confident in that. So we ran a workshop in collaboration with the Scottish Government, um, it was last month, and we talked through the process in terms of what should actually, what an officer should be looking out for and how they should start preparing cases and evidence gathering where they think that there's a blight on a community. Um, and I think that's the significant part of it. The property has to have a bite on the community and public interest has to trump um, the private human rights. So from what, from what you're saying, it sounds like um, not, not many, pe not many pe councils have been confident enough to use these powers. No, councils are not, some councils are, um, but others aren't. And ones where they aren't often will tell you that there's a resource issue as well, because there's conflicting priorities for legal services. And I think part of our workshop was to say, well, if we, if the empty homes officer can do as much of the work as possible to try and get it to a point where there's limited requirement for the legal services, then that should maybe um, assist with trying to bring that a compulsory purchase order to um, a forefront, if you know what I mean, because often it is time, and then it goes to the legal team, and they'll go back and say, "Well, actually, you haven't done this this step or that step or the next step," and they're behind on it. Um, and that's where I think we were trying to empower our officers to do that. There's also the issue of cost and um, keeping that money away until you know somebody comes in to make a claim. Um, and councils will tell you that that's a significant barrier. Anything? I don't really have anything to add to that, really, but I just okay. know that, you know, in my time as working in this field, you know, it's just been councils didn't use CPO for housing, use it for everything else, but housing yeah. seems to be too hard. Yeah. I wonder if Shahina, if you've got any any more evidence of on that that you could share with us, and who's I think who's using these powers and who's not. I think there was a recent CPO of housing in Dundee, Dundee that I just recently saw in Rosangle, and I only remember that because I grew up in Rosangle. Um, but yeah, um, Falkirk have used it, um, Stirling have used it for empty homes, Argyll and Butte recently um, used it for empty homes and they were showcasing the case study at our recent workshop. So it is being used um, and we are promoting the use of it in, you know, as, as, a, as one of the options. But actually, we're promoting officers doing the legwork for it in most cases so that they have the evidence there already. Is there a difficulty with tracing owners of properties? Definitely. I think that's one thing that comes up significantly. Um, empty homes officers will tell us we can't find an owner. In fact, we've got a case on the empty homes advice service where we're finding it difficult to trace an owner. It was a property in Edinburgh. It's been lying empty for about over 10 years, I think. It was, in, it was previously a fish shop with um, accommodation above it, and there was we can't seem to trace who owns that property. Like, it seems to come to a halt at some point. Um, so that's definitely an issue. What's the sticking point? What was the barrier to finding out this information? I think the title deed it was um, at a point where the person who said they own the property has got a bit of paper saying that they've got the title, but they're not convinced that they actually own that property. Um, I'm not the expert in the advice or officer field, so I can't go too much into it, but I can definitely come back and give a little bit more information on that specific case. That would be good, because you can't possibly use a CPO if you don't know who owns it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think what they're doing is um, we're looking at like private genealogists to try and trace, you know, an owner of that property, but it's just difficult, mm. and that is that's quite. I don't think it's um, significant volumes of cases, but I think from memory it would be about thirteen percent of cases. Now I could be wrong, and that just it's just just from memory when I'm looking because we're just getting our annual survey back this year, and I'm reporting back on what's going on. So it's not significant, but these ones cause significant issues because you can't um, then bring them back into use, or if you can't engage with an owner. 
Thirteen percent. That's still yeah. quite a bit. Of course, it is. Quite yeah. a number, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What about um, the idea of having compulsory sale orders? Um, have we, you know, have you got any thoughts on how effective they might be, either of you? So we've pushed for a compulsory sale order um, as a recommendation from the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, and um, we've we've been assured that it'll be done through this programme for government. Um, I think it'll be better because it'll force it to market. It'll stop having to have a back-to-back -back agreement with either a developer or a housing associ association um, to take over the property and it'll um, eliminate that risk um, for the local authority. That's what local authorities are telling us at the moment. Yeah, I mean, we we're members of the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership and you know supported that um, proposal on, on compulsory sale orders. And I think they're, they're a useful tool to be added to the kind of armory of, of carrots and sticks that are available, um, you know, alongside things like um, obviously community right to buy um, vacant and derelict land or land detrimental to the community. Do you think there's a potential human rights issue? You know, if you if you own an empty house and you, if for whatever reason, just want to keep it that way. I think that's where you've got to evidence the blight on that p particular community. Um, I don't think it would be appropriate in all cases where a property is lying empty to, um, you know, go for a compulsory sale order. But if your property is causing an impact on that local community, whether it's, you know, an economic impact or if it's, um, you know, causing your property to flood or, um, you know, those types of things, then I think, and if you've tried everything, you've tried to engage with that owner, then I think it is an appropriate measure. But I do stress that you know all advice and information has to be taken first. Yeah. And kind of concentrations of empty property, and or, or you know, uh, people could be leaving several empty properties empty um, in a community, and that can restrict in some rural communities where, where where drainage capacity is an issue. They're all taking up capacity in the system, all these empty properties. So um, they're preventing further development in some respects. Okay. One, one more question from me. It's just a, kind of a general one, really. Um, it's about the range of powers that councils ha have and, and, and whether you think they're effective enough and, and what else, if, if you don't, what else you'd, you'd like to see? Councils don't have a, a great range of powers. I suppose they have um, amenity notices and works enforcement notices, but from what councils tell us, you then have to have resource to then enforce that enforcement. Um, and they don't often have that. That can take time. I would just say often, you know, from us, that an empty homes officer in every local authority in Scotland would, you know, be a starting point because they can then start working with the owners. It, often in some local authorities, they have two empty homes officers now. Um, and I think that's where, where we should be going because if we've got somebody that can give particular advice and information to an owner, then properties are more likely to be brought back into use. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think that kind of enabling function that the empty homes officers in terms of, you know, creating solutions where, where which, ex, you know, using the tools that exist. I mean, I would, you know, put in, put in a bit of a word for kind of some kind of leasing schemes or whether that's voluntary or compulsory, um, you know, to and use them as maybe as a kind of, I've used the phrase less nuclear in my evidence, but it's a kind of like a, it's a, perhaps, a, you know, communities and councils and others don't necessarily want to take on properties, but would like to see, see it used. And so perhaps if they can, it can be, there can be a leasing arrangement can perhaps, you know, um, is a less, less strenuous, less maybe a stringent um, um, enforcement that needs to happen. Anything you mentioned earlier? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks, Convener. Thank you very much. Andy, you've got a couple of areas you wanted to ask questions on. Thanks uh, very much, Convener. Uh, and thanks for your uh, written evidence. It's been very useful um, background for this inquiry. I just want to look at the council tax levy. Um, and you talked, Jean, quite a bit about um, the use of this uh, levy and what it was in, intended uh, for. Of course, it's up to local government to decide for itself how to use this levy. But I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on how it is actually being used um, and the potential impact of it. 
Definitely. Um, we've looked at particular cases in a local authority where there is no empty homes officer and how they have implemented the charge quite recently. And we've had cases coming through to our empty homes advice service and they have a blanket approach to um, cases that are empty for over 12 months, they will immediately get the 200% charge. Um, if you have a blanket approach, it can often stop properties being brought back into use because that is an additional cost factor. So there is good practice where, you know, councils will say, actually, we'll apply discretion. We'll use the carrot and stick approach where we will say, OK, you're, bring, you, you're evidencing to us that you're bringing this property back into use. We'll give you a little bit of discretion on that. We might reduce the charge down to 90% while you're doing that. And once it's brought back into use, the council will then get the 100% council tax. And we see that as a good way of using the charge. But the blanket approach to us is not what you know is intended. And the message that I give to local authorities is that actually when you're using it with discretion, you're encouraging properties to be brought back into use. Often, when you're using this blanket approach, often these um, um, properties can run into arrears as well. So, you know, although they can put an inhibition on the property to gain that if the property was to sell, at that moment, it's not in the council's interest either. And so, the, I mean, so to be clear, councils have the discretion to, for example, give relief on one property and then the one immediately next door, they can do something completely different. Yeah, absolutely. It's up to the council how they, you know, vary yeah. that. There is the guidance. That's and there. you're saying that the blanket approach is, is not something you support, but is there any evidence that the blanket approach um, is having uh, um, less of an effect than a... A discretionary approach? Well, we had a case that came through to the Empty Homes Advice Service where um, a, a guy was um, refurbishing a property um, and he was refurbishing the property to move into and had quite a stringent budget to refurbish that property. And with the additional 200% council tax charge, he was saying that was impacting on you know some of the refurbishments that he was able to make onto that property and might... Um, impact on when he would be able to move into that house. We um, supported an appeal. We uh, um, helped the gentleman to draft an appeal to the local authority, which was successful, and that property was brought back into use uh, um, on time and on budget for that particular person. I don't support it at all times. I do think sometimes that, you know, if you choose to leave your property empty and you don't really want to do anything with it, then I, the 200% levy should but, be there. But that's, so that's anecdotal evidence. Is there any systematic evidence? Um, not, not specifically. Okay. We've looked at cases. We're looking at cases at the moment. We've done um, a policy document on how councils are applying it, so what councils are doing what, and I can send that on if, you, if that's That'd of interest. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can have a look to see, you know, because it, it is setting out every council's policy on as a starting point on the levy. OK, um, I just want to ask a few questions about data as well. I mean, you both raised this uh, in your evidence. Um, I mean, I note that the, the number of um, empty homes has been kind of steadily rising over the last 10 years, not hugely, but steadily um, rising. I note also in uh, your evidence, um, Mr Logie, that you observe that Statistics Scotland provide data on empty homes by census data zone, um, but it'd be useful to have this as a GIS resource, that's a geographic information um, resource, and it'd be also useful to know the ownership of properties and the reasons they're empty. So my question is how uh, we have data on each census data zone but we don't actually have a, a map or data that one could download to identify exactly where everything is. Is that correct? As far as I'm aware, yeah. I mean, uh, it might be beyond my, beyond my skills in terms of interrogating Statistics Scotland's website that you might be able to do it as a, okay. as a map, but um, I couldn't do it. I think Shahina's doing some work on that. One of the things that we're commissioning over summer is looking at a GIS mapping of empty properties um, across Scotland at a national level, not at a granular level, but at a, 
a data zone level. Um, we have drafted up some questions and we're doing it through independent researchers. So that will give us an idea of where the properties are. And it is to then look at what are the solutions to bringing those properties back into use. Are there any trends? Are there any data? You know, things that we don't know already that will influence what where we want to go with empty properties. That will hopefully be ready for the public in November at our annual conference this year. And so will that provide um, the kind of data that allows you then to analyse the various reasons you cite as to why homes are empty in a systematic way in order to be able to compare, for example, different policies on council tax or different policies that empty homes officers um, are adopting for similar kinds of cases across the country? So we hope so. We hope that it'll give us a much better insight, but it is dependent on what we get back, you know, and the information that we get back. I certainly know that some councils do GIS mapping of their empty properties. Um, off the top of my head, I can say to you, I think Angus Council used GIS mapping, North Ayrshire Council used GIS mapping, but I know that other councils don't, and it'll depend on the information that we get back as to, you know, what we can look at. But we are hoping to tie it in with different data sets as well, so we can, you know, look to see what the, you know, the, the insight comes back. Um, it's similar to something that England did with their empty homes. Um, the Empty Homes Agency carried out a similar sort of survey, but we know that we've got a different context here, so we're just looking to change the questions that we ask. Okay. And just finally, returning back to the question on, on ownership, you're talking about the problems in tracing owners, but to be clear, you don't have a problem in finding the title. It's the fact that the name in that title might be 30 years ago, <coughs> and you don't know where the person is. You don't even know if they're alive. It's those kind of issues. Yeah, yep. To an end. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Alexander. You want to... Thank you, Camilla. We've talked this morning about the, the success uh, that you've seen uh, from the government putting in some schemes, and also you've, you've talked about some of the councils who have done well uh, when they have prioritised uh, and put some investment uh, into that, whether that is uh, a scheme they're doing themselves or they have that uh, dedicated officer uh, to try and support uh, and, and bring that together. Uh, and I certainly saw that from from my time within Perth and Canross when we introduced that, uh, that, that was a, a pilot scheme that really proved really very successful. And especially for the sort of uh, city centre, uh, where, where we had a number of properties that you've identified today uh, that may have a shop and something above it, uh, and that was two properties that we were trying to uh, utilise. So I think that, that, that there's a role uh, for these incentives. Uh, but, but can I ask you, uh, what do you see that financial incentive being? Uh, and, and how important uh, is it for the councillors to, to have that uh, and use that power uh, to ensure that they can collaborate with uh, their communities that they represent uh, and also how the Scottish Government would fit into that process? I would think that many of the officers that come back to us tell us that they're a huge issue for bringing properties back into use is struggling to finance repairs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's there's a role for funding to be made available, um, but I recognise that we're in a, you know in a time where there are limited funds at a local level. But I do think that that's what would probably speed up properties yeah. being brought back into use. However, I still think that you know the softer measures work as well. Um, I think there's also a role for other organisations and I think that's something that we promoted at our last conference mm -hmm. where we were looking at a step change agenda. We see that there's um, organisations such as the YMCA in Glenrothes mm -hmm. um, who have an empty homes programme and they are looking at properties that, you know, are are not on the market that are empty for significant periods of time mm -hmm. and that actually if a developer was to go in and buy these properties and bring them back into use there would be no financial incentive in it for them mm -hmm. but they have managed to attract funding from different sources mm -hmm. and bring the property back into use and the reason that these properties were so useful for them is they have supported accommodation for a young people that are homeless or at risk of homelessness and they were looking on looking for follow-on accommodation in the communities that were already settled 
and the empty properties seemed an ideal match for them and they were able to put in minimal sums to get properties because the rest of it attracted funding. There's schemes such as, um, I think we quoted in our um, submission paper, The Latch, who um, use volunteers to bring properties back into use. And so they're using um, two things. So they're bringing properties back into use for affordable housing, but they're also meeting a skill shop. So people uh, uh, allowing empty properties to be used to upskill certain target groups. Um, so I think that's something that we're looking at at the moment. We're looking to try and set up a project with um, a, as a strategic partnership to try and create an operate, operational business model that we can say, actually, look, this is how it works in practice and try and share that best practice. As you've identified, you know, if, if there's, a, there's a niche in the market anyway, mm -hmm. uh, there's a need, uh, and, and it's just by trying to marry the two together, and then the funding will come. Uh, so... In that rule, what, what if at all do you think that the Scottish Government uh, Housing Investment Programme, what impact should it have on this whole programme and, and how should it be in, uh, supporting and trying to ensure that, that, that what you've identified is taking place? The Scottish Government have allowed us um, a small fund that we are able to um, now allocate to um, in, as part of a strategic partnership and it's something that we're looking to pilot. In terms of what their role is, I, d I wouldn't, I don't have an answer for you there I mean, right if, now. Mm. We've had a role through the Rural and Islands Housing Fund yeah. in terms of supporting community projects on which you're looking at bringing back properties into use. At Tower Brax, for example, kind of, we we were working with What If, which is the local community trust there, and um, there's a number of empty properties in the village, and it kind of. I think it maybe sums up a lot of the issues that people have had um, in regarding empty properties because the worst ones were either they couldn't get the trace the owner or the person wouldn't sell. So they end up having to buy one which was actually just on the market and, and do that up um, and, and with, with Rural and Islands Housing Fund money. Um, but they wanted, it was the ones which were really blighting the community that they wanted to get their hands on. It, it, and it is, it's the, it's the eyesores uh, that, that appear yeah. uh, and, and we, we have them in many communities and, and as you've identified it maybe because the, there's no longer anyone there or there's a, uh, there's a connection that's been lost uh, or there's documentation that's no longer there to try and make that happen and they're the hardest ones to crack uh, to ensure that you try and get that because yeah. once, you, once you get that uh, it then has a knock on effect. Because it's particularly galling in places where there's real lack of affordable housing for local people. You know, the first project I ever did was in the community of Lagan on Strass Bay, and there was five empty properties that came on the market, and we helped the community buy those properties and do them up. And that was, you know, that community was really suffering from, from lack of housing yeah. and lack of people being able to employ, be employed locally because they couldn't find a house. So, um, you know, it's it's marrying these two things together um, that that is that is crucial, and we can either do that through communities taking on properties to to buying them and, and then doing them up themselves and then renting them out, or conceivably communities leasing properties from from owners who haven't got the wherewithal, the money, or whatever other to 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 do up the properties, but the community do. So we need a tool, and and you know the rural housing. Rural and Islands Housing Fund could be that, that tool, tool to enable that, yeah. but they have certain rules around perpetuity, exactly. which which I'd like to, to, and, get and, to and, review. and I think you know that that you've identified that issue, uh, and and that there's a huge opportunity there. Yeah, there's a huge uh, opportunity. Uh, and and by by yeah. by broadening some of that scope and by uh, seeing and giving some leeway to organisations that you've identified just by saying that there, that shows, and that's a massive commitment because it, it's not just the house; it's the knock-on effect of employment, yeah. of sustainability, yeah. of a school, of a post office, whatever. That can all flow from making sure that, that these number of properties yeah. have been uh, renovated and are back on the market and people can use them. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, and, 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 and even when you look at the, the town centres where you have shops at the bottom uh, being used, but numbers of flats above them uh, that are not, that's another idea that you should be trying to convert and support because by doing that, uh, <coughs> it then it generates some life back into, into that community. So. I, I, you know, I, I think that you identify a very, very important role that the government should be taking on board because by doing that, it will enhance and support what you're trying to do uh, and what councils are trying to do to solve the problem. 
Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Alec? Yeah. Can I ask, I mean, you've highlighted quite a number of different cases where you would say it's good practice. Is there some kind of good practice guide that's out there? And can I ask, do you believe that, that it's a mix and a match in terms of how serious local authorities take the empty homes issue? Um, we share, we have knowledge exchange forums like best practice meetings that we have um, quarterly um, across Scotland. So we have one in, in the central belt and one in the north and officers come together. We have quite high attendance at these um, best practice meetings. We have about 20, 22 people coming to our central best practice and about 15 to the northern best practice. Um, and that's where we tend to share best practice. We also have an online forum on the Knowledge Hub um, that anybody can come along and ask to be a member of and can see all the best practice that we do and share. Um, there definitely is a, um, you know, a mismatch in terms of how much local authorities um, dedicate to empty homes work. And that's something that I think, you know, some local authorities see the benefits of it more than others. And that's where my role is to try and encourage all local authorities to actually see the importance of empty homes work. It makes sense. It doesn't make sense to leave properties lying at empty. You know, um, we've seen some really good examples of um, empty homes buybacks, you know, where they're buying back um local authority, ex-local authority properties, or even properties that meet their housing need. Um, there was a really good one, I think, in North Ayrshire, where it was a town centre property that was causing significant um, issues to the neighbours next door. And they were able to use it to buy it back as affordable housing supply. Now, their business plan for affordable housing supply is £128,000 for a brand new empty property by the time they bought, uh, for a brand new new build, sorry, but when they bought this empty property, I think it cost them something like in the region of 60,000. So they've added supply at half the price um, and it's in the town centre, it's in their strategic priority area. So it makes sense. And that's the sort of message that we go, we share with local authorities. We are also um, putting together what's called a value tool. We had one which I think was a bit difficult to read and didn't flow. And we are putting together another value to it. And we hope to update our website to actually show this value to it. And we want to be able to make it so that local authorities can look to see what authority is similar to mine, what are they doing, what, what has worked for them, that sort of thing. So Shelter Scotland, you know, talk about mm -hmm. the housing crisis mm -hmm. in Scotland. I mean, what kind of contribution can tackling the empty homes issue make to work towards tackling definitely. the crisis? Definitely. I think that um, it can make a contribution. It can increase, whether it's um, affordable housing supply, in some cases it can work, but actually just increasing supply in areas of pressure, such as, for example, in Edinburgh, where we've got significant pressure on the housing market, if we're bringing properties back into use you know, for normal supply, that obviously has a knock-on effect to affordable housing supply as well. So, it so I'm trying to where I'm trying to go with this, I think, mm -hmm. is that there's 32 local authorities, and you know I accept the flexibility. Indeed, when it comes to using council tax, I've argued for flexibility in cases that that have represented people. But is there sort of a minimal standard that should apply within local authorities? So, I think so Andy talks about GIS mapping, and you see there's two councils, North Ayrshire and one other. I think there's more councils than that, but that's just the two that I knew from the top of my head. Should we, um, should we have more minimal standards? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I, think for, I think the starting point is to have a dedicated empty homes officer. Every local authority <coughs> in Scotland should have one. At the moment, we have 21 councils that have an empty homes officer, you know, or some sort of empty home service. And I think that as that's the minimum st standard for me. I think, um, yeah, linking um, empty home strategies, so looking at what their empty home strategy is, we'll often feed into consultations and say, actually, this is your strategy and this is what we know, we understand about your local area and this is what we think should be in your strategy. Um, I think that they should be linking it to local development plans and, yeah, GIS mapping would be ideal to have so that they can look to see where 
you know, they might have an another regeneration interest and the empty property officer, empty homes officer should be involved in that. What works quite well in some areas as well, which we talk about, is where they have um, working groups. So different departments are brought round the table. So, for example, in Argyll and Butte, Perth and Kinross, that sort of, um, Dumfries and Galloway, they have a working group where they have um, building standards, they have environmental health, they have the empty homes officer, because every single different department has a different agenda for that empty property, whereas it's the only the empty homes officer that wants to bring that property back into use often. And so these type of working groups work well as well. Okay. I mean, I think that's useful. I think it would be useful if you've got views that set a minimum standard. And because if, if we're investigating this, I suppose I've heard people talk about empty homes for for years, and you've highlighted that there is some good practice and there is progress. But is that progress fast enough? And what is it we actually need to be doing in Scotland to make that happen? Definitely, I suppose the dedicated empty homes officer is the minimum standard from the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership point of view and the different tools that then comes around because the Empty Homes Officer is now in place to implement those. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. Can I just ask one further question to that and then I'll bring in Kenny Gibson and then Annabelle. Uh, has there been any cost benefit an analysis of local authority employment of Empty Homes Officers? There has been at um, small local levels rather than at, you know, a wider national level. So um, some local authorities have looked at how much council tax has come in rather than looking at just, you know, what actual impact this is having on a community. And again, this is where our value tool that we are going to, uh, you know, um, launch pretty soon will show, you know, the different um, value at a local level in terms of um, increasing footfall into a local community in terms of sustaining that community. Um, you know, the average cost to an empty homeowner to leave their property empty is something between seven and eight thousand pounds, you know, in lost rent and, you know, council tax payments, that sort of thing. So the cost benefit analysis has been, you know, done at different levels at local authority areas. Yeah, I wonder if, if it'd be useful for us just to see that, but would there be any sort of wider cost benefit analysis being done in the way that you were suggesting there? I don't, I don't think there's been anything wider that's been done. But, sorry, would the intention be? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, yeah. 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 Okay, Mr Lowe, yeah, I think you were wanting to come in on the last point, no? No, it was just to say that I think that um, empty home strategies that Sheena was talking about is needs to be a crucial part of local local authorities' housing strategy, general housing strategy, in a rural context in particular, one or two empty properties pro you know, can deliver affordable housing in places that a housing association wouldn't go because they're looking at two or four or six houses at a minimum in terms of new build development or there's there's planning const constrictions or drainage constrictions on new build development. So the empty homes and bringing those back into use for affordable housing is a crucial part of, of general housing strategy. Just to add that. That makes perfect sense. Kenny, you want to come? Yes, uh, first of all, sorry for being late this morning. Good morning, panel. Um, the best practice thing for me is really fundamental. And, and I mean, you convener touched on something. I was going to touch on cost benefit. I mean, to me, it seems overwhelming the arguments that are being made for empty homes officers. And I'm quite shocked, actually, that, that you know, that, that uh, not every Scottish local authority has them. And uh, also that cost benefit is not being done by councils in the round. It just seems to be council tax rather than looking at the impact on the general community. So I think that's a piece of work that we would welcome or indeed uh, maybe perhaps we should press the Scottish Government to work with you on that. Because there's clearly a Scottish Empty Homes Best Practice Group and you've mentioned authorities from Angus, Dundee, <coughs> Perkin Ross, etc. who are doing excellent work and I think we would all want to see that uh, spread. Now, you said that where there are empty homes officers, there's one and some have got two. Given the scale of the... The problem, the tens of thousands of empty homes figures vary. Um, is, uh, is one or two officers enough, really? I mean, is, clearly it seems to me that they, mu they must be run off their feet, really. They're absolutely right. We were looking at the average caseload yesterday, you know, um, from officers that are coming back to us, and they're in the hundreds, and you think, how can anybody run with an average caseload of over, you know, that sort of amount um, and actually get, you know, the, you know, the impact that they need to have? So, yeah, definitely more needs to be done. But I suppose we're at a starting point. We're at a point where we're trying to get, you know, all councils to do it and then push forward with that. Okay. 
Yeah, and trying to show council it's a win-win, actually. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it definitely is a win-win. It mm -hmm. just makes sense. Yeah, I know. It seems to me so obvious. But, uh, OK, I, I, want to, I want to move on, uh, Mr Logie, to talk about the Rural and Islands Housing Fund. I mean, you talk about the £75,000 a, a unit, and you see that that's kind of restrictive there um, in terms of the main fund. Projects have to be focused on smaller, easier to refurb properties which don't have the same ambition or scale to make a real difference at a wider level. Can you talk a wee bit more about that and how you would like to see um, changes being made in that area? I don't think oh, I sorry, that's Sahina's actually. Sorry, that's Sahina's. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I think submission, but I mean, I, I, I probably best if I ask her to answer, and you can comment on it because I'm <laughs> going to move on to your paper in a minute. Use as much. Use as much. Yours is only a two page. Yours is much more. <laughs> sorry, Sahina. Yeah, I reckon uh, we've supported some applications to the Rural and Island Housing Fund, and we have seen that you know that the limitations are sometimes because of the level of the fund and because of often like there was I think there was a case where the Rural and Island Housing Fund was supporting a property to be brought back into use, but there was about another nine funders, um, and one funder pulled out, and then the whole project stopped, and you know that. That was quite significant in terms of we thought that's the property. It's a real eyesore. Um, was it? Was I think it was. Uh, I don't want to say which one it is, just in case I'm getting it wrong. But I think it was. Was it Coldstream? Do you know about that? I don't know about Coldstream. Okay, there was a property that was um, had ten different funders and one pulled out at the last minute and that caused it to fail mm -hmm. whereas if the rural and island housing fund had you know a greater capacity then that would have just gone gone ahead. Was there, sorry, I mean, I could. I mean, yeah. to be honest, it probably. I mean, I don't know the details of the Coldstream one, but I know that, you know it, it didn't go ahead. But you know, the, there is flexibility within the rural Islands housing fund to to spend more than seventy four thousand per per unit. Um, you know, it can be it's, that's the benchmark. That's the average that they're looking for across the piece in terms of all their grants. So there can there can be a hundred thousand pound grants um, or or fifty thousand pound grants. It's you know, the 74 is an average, so um, there is flexibility there. Yeah, because, I mean, one of the issues, I mean, I've got Cumbria and Arne in my constituency, and, of course, one of the issues is the cost of building on islands is significantly higher than actually building on the mainland, and so there's concerns about, you know, that making it less economic, because, I mean, a, a, you know, a housing association, local authority might say, well, I can build 100 on the mainland for 60, 70 on an island. In, in in island communities, it is higher. It is eighty four thousand rather than seventy four thousand. Mm -hmm. And I think Ireland is included in the West Highlands. Part yes. of that. Well, so I mean, yes. In terms I mean, of that, that 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 grant funding ability. I, I, so. I mean, I mean. So, look, you touch on um, the West of Ireland. Your uh, submission. You say five point eight percent of homes are empty, almost double the North Eastern average of three percent. At the same time, twenty five percent of homes are second homes, and average house prices significantly higher. They are indeed significantly higher and there's a lot of negative equity on the island, but we also have a, a real issue about a shortage of affordable mm. housing. Uh, in view of that, do you think that the compulsory sale orders would have an impact uh, on that? Um, I do, uh, because I mean, I know <coughs> I know um, <coughs> landowners on, on Arran who have demolished lots of empty properties to make way for um, farm buildings and the like. Um, and they've got permission to demolish those from North Ayrshire Council. Um, and those could have been, they were perfectly servable houses. Now, there's probably com maybe compelling farm business reasons as to why those those houses couldn't be used in the particular location they were. But, you know, we're, we're it's a bit galling to see properties demolished when there's when there's so much housing need within, within that context. Yeah, my understanding there are other reasons I, I, won't, I won't go into it at this uh, moment uh, in time. But um, I mean, I, I, I've been MSP in Cunningham North more than 12 years now, and there's a house in Coburnie, Main Street, that was empty when I was elected, and it's still empty. The owner's an Isle of Man, and we can't get anything. You know, the, the, the council's kind of tattered up a wee bit, so it's not quite as much an eyesore as it used mm. to be. But there's a real frustration in the community, the local authority. Mm. Everyone really who passes by that and sees it about this inability to actually get a hold of this property and have something done with it. Yeah. Um, so um, you, you'll be pressing the Scottish government to make sure that this legislation is introduced this side of the next Scottish Parliament election. Definitely. Yeah. Good. That's something I would certainly support. I'm doing the same, obviously. But it's always good to have witnesses saying the same kind kind of a, a thing. And just lastly, if I may, convener. Um, 
touched on the council tax levy. Andy talked about that. I, I've had uh, a number of constituents come to me who have been quite upset about uh, this because they feel that uh, North Eastern Council, which is flexible in many ways, has been following the strictures of this and optimising, well, maximising their income through this, frankly, and not a not putting it back into housing specifically, but people feel as if, you know, I bought a house um, which is uh, which is empty, but it's not got a roof on it, you know what I mean? And it's taken um, a long time to actually refurbish, etc, etc, and immediately the these time limits are reached, they slap the 200% on, and that makes it really difficult for people to actually afford to finish them sometimes. And whenever I've went to... Uh, the council with these cases, I think I've had four, five, maybe six over the since 2013. They've just said, "No, I'm sorry, that's it." And there's been absolutely no hint of uh, flexibility in terms of these cases. How, how do you feel? There's uh, this varies across Scotland. Is this is this the norm, or some better than others? Would would you feel we are? With there are this? some better than others, but I think that there's still more to be done, and I think that. The government guidance obviously is only guidance, and I wonder if there should be, you know, there shouldn't be that degree of flexibility in terms of, you know, how they could, if somebody is showing that they're bringing a property back into use, and if the spirit of the legislation is to unlock empty homes, then perhaps more needs to be done, at, you know, at council tax level, you know, getting that message out to council tax managers that actually this is what the spirit of that legislation is rather than, you know, that blanket approach. If there are major structural repairs, it just makes sense to actually, you know, that it is enshrined in legislation with major structural repairs that they have to give some leeway, but often that leeway is not enough. Is it six months? And that's often not enough for somebody to, you know, confirm that. Yeah, it seems to me it's the letter of the law that's used here rather than the spirit of the law. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. And... Um, I would say that that seems to be an area of complaints that come through to the Empty Homes Advice Service as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, sir. Uh, thank you, Kavira. Um, yes, just picking up on a few points. I mean, it's been mentioned, I think Shahida mentioned that um, 21 local authorities have an empty homes officer, so 11 don't. Why don't they? Well, I'm in conversations with four of them, and four of them at the moment are what are either looking to get an empty homes officer or have d um, completed a business case for an empty homes officer. So we're in progress progressive discussions with those authorities. Okay. Um, so that would seven. Yeah, and there's only so many authorities. Who, who are the seven that are just not even yeah. discussing them? I don't really want to name and shame local authorities, oh, to be honest. honest well, you. perhaps you could write to the committee with a list because I think it would be useful yeah. to know, yeah, we want to know who's, yeah, absolutely. who's not getting on the programme. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I can do that. Great. Um, so, uh, and I, I, I was going to ask about the cost-benefit analysis. I mean, it seems to be, as the convener rightly raised, I mean, that's the kind of crucial mm -hmm. element um, yeah, and I think to, that to test uh, success or otherwise, and well, certainly usefulness uh, in trying to tackle this problem. Um, in your submission, Shahina, and this was an issue I alluded to earlier, um, the issue of data, which is really crucial here. So I note that on page, well, uh, page 16, but uh, under the response to question eight of the... Uh, consultation from the committee, um, you make the point, quite rightly, so one figure is, is the figure of the National Records of Scotland, uh, which has a figure of 79,000 empty properties, but this will include new homes yet to be occupied and, and dwelling houses that are awaiting demolition. So you feel that that therefore overstates uh, uh, the scale of the problem in Scotland, but then you go on to, to quote in contrast uh, statistics published by the Scottish Government, which report that approximately 39,000 properties uh, as long-term empty, but you feel this may um, understate the uh, scale of the problem in terms of the coverage, uh, 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 including the fact that it excludes uh, other properties, uh, properties, certain properties exempt from council tax. So, in that regard, I note that uh, the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership intends to carry out a national empty homes survey later this year. Could you give us a wee bit more information about that, when you intend to do that, exactly how you'll go about that? Because it seems to me that actually the, 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 the key element that will allow us all to move forward in this issue is to establish the facts, establish how many empty homes and establish the reason why they're empty. And therefore, one can start to look at solutions for each category. So it'd be really interesting to hear how you intend to go about that really crucial piece of, piece of work. So at the moment, um, 
we are in conversations with um, independent researchers. We are looking at the data that we already hold. So some of the things that we ask officers annually is, um, previously we used to ask it as one question, but one question why a home became empty and lies still is empty, whereas now we've broken that question down into t in terms of why do homes become empty? Why do they continue to stay empty? And we've asked um, officers this year to report back on that to try and give us a deeper understanding. This questionnaire that we're looking at is um, looking at what authorities will have. So we've, I'm just going to see if I can find it actually. I think I've brought it with me. Let's take a bit more of an insight. It's to establish whether there's a link between the reasons home initially become empty and reasons why they often remain empty. Um, build a greater understanding of what initiatives may generally work to assist in bringing empty homes back into use and identify areas with high volumes of empty homes where specific or intensive in initiatives may be needed. Um, like I said, it was modelled on a similar survey, but I think we have a Scottish context here, and so we're looking at what actually exists already, because we have some different data sets and sources. So we've looked at questions. Um, the timescale for those questions is June. We are hoping to get the questionnaire out to chief housing officers in Scotland. And we then hope to promote it. We're hoping to get the responses back by August to give us time to do some analysis and launch it at our conference in November. In terms of how we want that questionnaire to look like, we're trying to do it what's called a map -tionnaire. So it's a questionnaire on a map. I love that word. It's a questionnaire on a map. And we're hoping that officers can will be more engaged and will complete will actually enjoy completing it but also it'll give us the information that we need by hopefully we're thinking these are where the empty homes are in this world and you can you know draw a red circle around it that's the sort of intention behind it so not totally at a granular level but at a local level to give us the insight if there are clusters of empty properties you know, what can be done about those? Is there a certain solution that needs to be applied for those? That type of thing. Okay, um, so that's interesting that your timescale will take you to November 2019, and that's something we may wish to reflect upon in terms of our work as a committee. But, um, I mean, presumably also, you know, because data really is key here, I believe, and, and you know, I wonder then what um, intention would you have to... Uh, you know, have discussions with National Records of Scotland and have discussions with the Scottish Government statisticians about the data they collect so that in the end of the day, hopefully we can extrapolate one set of data that covers the same stuff because that would be helpful for everybody, I think, to, yeah. to make progress. And I think that's why we chose to go with independent researchers because mm -hmm. they can support that for us because mm -hmm. obviously we have everything else that we need to do on, on a sure. daily basis and that's why we've gone to commission that research and that will be worked with the Scottish Government Good. statisticians. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that, that'll do for today's meeting, thank you. I think you answered quite a lot of very useful questions. Yeah, good answer, sorry. No, what? Is, is COSLA, um, are you working with COSLA to press local authorities to employ um, empty homes officers? Because I recently presented at the COSLA Local Government and Communities Board um, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was some interest from some of the councils that don't have an empty homes officer there. And we've since reached out to them. Okay, th thanks, Kevin. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up, Kenny. Uh, Okay, so a couple of things we'd ask then is maybe if we could get a copy of this questionnaire when it's ready. Yeah. Right, uh, or map or whatever it's called. Yep. And uh, obviously, as suggested earlier on, if we could find out who has and who hasn't got the uh, empty homes officers, that'd be very useful. So thank you very much for attending today's session on the empty homes. And the committee will spend the remainder of the meeting in private. This will include a discussion on the evidence we've just heard. So thank you very much. And I now move the session into private. <laughs>